back. I had to make a quick cut. I've decided to upload these as separate files instead of all as one video. That way we don't have a four hour video in the playlist. That'd be ridiculous. So we're getting back to it. And first of all, we need to know what is meta metacognition. And sadly, the reading did not define it correctly. So let's just use the definition in the, in the lecture slides, which is metacognition is a process of acquiring knowledge and understanding about the process by which we acquire knowledge and understanding. The reason we have that definition is because cognition's definition is the process by which we acquire knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and sense perception. And meta, the definition of that, well, it's a prefix that refers to higher order. Examples are meta studies, metaphysics, and meta humans. So, why should we care about it? Well, first, like always, we have a negative and a positive reasoning. I apparently cannot write on this screen. Negative and positive. For the negative is that we as humans are imperfect organizers. Our condition is subject to all kinds of errors and misleads us when we acquire knowledge and understanding. So in its sense, uh, we have well, the negative reason for thinking, caring about it is because human reasoning is flawed. All right. Similar to optical illusions, which are covered up by ways of senses that are up, there are cognitive errors caused by the way our thinking is set up. These cognitive errors even cause us to reason incorrectly. If we want to acquire knowledge and understanding, metacognition can help us avoid these errors. And as for why these are positive purposes, in a sense, by knowing our inconsistencies and biases will help us realize which aspects of people's worldviews are founded on bias. Eliminating these biases also paves way for more accurate theory of the world. So in a sense, the positive reason why we should care about this is because by eliminating bias, ting bias, we can see world more clearly. And I misspelled bias. Actually, spelled like this. B -ass. There we go. In a sense, we care about it because metacognition can help us to avoid errors. How does it help us avoid errors? Well, metacognition can help us by making us aware of ways we tend to go wrong while trying to acquire knowledge or understanding. If we are aware of how things can go wrong, we are more likely to pay more careful attention to how we think about things and thus are more likely to avoid going wrong. The more we practice this, the higher order awareness our thinking becomes. We develop a general habit or posture of metacognitive skepticism, which goes back to the whole positive and negative table. And this skepticism is a habit that keeps us generally aware that we are imperfect, specifically aware that we might be going wrong in the process of acquiring knowledge and understanding. So in a sense, if we know there's a chance we could be going wrong, we're more likely to check to see if we have mistakes somewhere along the line. If someone believes they are right from beginning to end, they will not check their own reasoning, which can lead to a lot of errors. In a sense, metacognition is why we use, we do math with a pencil and not a pen for the most part, unless you're a rebel <laughs> or arrogant, or maybe you're just that good. I don't know. But most people will, who take math seriously will do with a pencil. They can erase their mistakes that way. In a sense, metacognition skepticism is one specific component of the critical posture we discussed previously. The focuses of, metal, of metacognitive focus of metacognition are two phenomena, cognitive bias and cognitive heuristics. So let's figure out what those are. So cognitive bias is, it says flaws in how we process information. So flaws in info processing and
And in the case of cognitive heuristics, cognitive heuristics are mental shortcuts that we take when trying to figure something out. These are often unreliable and will lead us astray. So mental shortcuts that are often unreliable. I apparently can't spell, but that's just unreliable to the un to the initiated. You know what? Let's spell it correctly, okay? I'm not a doctor. I can't get away with spelling things incorrectly. So it is un re Lie able. All right. And of course, we have to talk about the Dunning Kruger effect. In 1999, physicist psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger, which is where we get Dunning Kruger from, they published a paper called The Unskilled and Unaware of It How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetences Leads to Inflated Self Assessments. In a sense, the rule is everyone thinks they're above average, and the less competent you are, the more likely you think you're competent. <laughs> so how do we explain this? When people are incompetent, they they don't want to really think about themselves being incompetent. Very few people want to believe they're actually incompetent, so they'll try to say that they're more competent than they are, and in a sad way, by doing so, they never realize how incompetent they are, thus leading to more bad decisions as a whole. In a sense, skills that engender competitive, I mean, competence in a particular domain are often the very same skills necessary to evaluate competence in that domain. In, in a sense, because they never developed the skills to be competent in, a, in some field or some area of study, they'll never be, comp they'll never be able to competently analyze their own their own abilities so part of it is just human ego okay no one wants to think that they are incompetent and people also have an easier time recognizing incompetence in others than in themselves which contributes to the overestimation in a sense you're more likely to think someone else is bad when it's likely that you yourself are also just as bad maybe you're not but for the ch there's a good chance you are and these results from the Dunning-Kruger effect were reproducing experiments. If you remember, the professor had us read the, the paper prior, so we knew that it should be a bell curve. But if you actually analyze it, it looks kind of like this. So this is uh, not competent, and this is competent. If you really analyze it, it would look something like this. Because <laughs> people like to believe they're on the top, but this is what it really is. So how do we overcome this effect? Well, first, to overcome Dunning-Kruger, to overcome Dunning-Kruger, we need to have humility. Okay. Only through humility will we be able to cast out our arrogance and understand that there are some things that we just don't know. Okay, it is impossible to learn everything in one lifetime, considering how much knowledge there actually is in the entire universe. However, you get more pr competent at overcoming the Dunning-Kruger effect by practicing. Okay, seeing as we all read the paper on Dunning Kruger, at least a good chunk of us did. We all, we all, not in all, but a large chunk of us, so the average amount of people in the class did pick average because it's probably, it was probably a test, right? <laughs> and the definite, and up next we have to talk about one of the most famous cognitive biases, and that is motivated reasoning. By definition, motivated reasoning is the unconscious tendency of individuals to fit their reasoning to conclusions that suit some end or goal they have. Why do people do this? And the reason being is cognitive dissonance. People like to believe 
that in the case of motivated reasoning, emotional attachments to some particular conclusion can bias the reasoning process in a favor that a conclusion to avoid or reduce cognitive dissonance. And the reason for that is because people, it, it's easier to get some, to trick someone than to convince them that they've been tricked. Motivated reasoning was first pioneered by Leon Festinger in 1957. A cognitive dissonance theory claims that being presented with conflicting pieces of information causes us psychological suffering. In response to the suffering or to avoid it, we will change our beliefs to make these pieces of information seem less conflicting. In best case scenario, we presented with the information and we change our beliefs to what is likely true. However, a good chunk of people are attached to their beliefs emotionally. That makes sense. Okay, you have to stand by something. There are some things people just have to stand for, okay? And that kind of makes them who they are. But at the same time, you also have to realize that just because you stand for it doesn't make it true. Example given the lecture slides is that if someone is attracted to someone else, that person may be attracted to either the image of that person, which may or may not be how that person that they are attracted to really behaves. So to overcome this, they need to think about whether or not they're attracted to the image and choose it over reality or whether or not they need to accept reality as a matter of fact. In addition, motivated reasoning is reinforcing. When you engage in it, you reduce your suffering through cognitive dissonance by inducing positive feelings. In a sense, if you could reason your idea, your goal, your end, your means, not your means, but your end plan, and make it to yourself at the very least seem plausible, then you're more likely to feel better. And it's harder to change your beliefs. And part of also why this is done is because some people just need, some people have a mechanism against gaslighting because it is also possible to use cognitive bias theory to convince people to believe absolute falsehoods if you can get them to agree with your promise, your premises that are absolutely true. The cognitive bias theory, the Dunning-Kruger effect, motivated reasoning. If you can get them to accept all of that and then you start gaslighting them by telling them it's the truth and you can trick them into believing that then you just convince someone to tell a lie. This is why people have motivated reasoning. This is why people have something they stand for that's occasionally unshakable. It's a bit irrational, but it is a defensive mechanism. I'm not saying that motiv motivated reasoning is wrong. I'm just saying that that's what happens, okay? Also, they're able to stand by their own beliefs through and through, and they also feel better as a whole. It is possible to reduce instances of motivated reasoning to become a better reasoner. You can also try to be aware of emotional attachments. So in a sense, if you're able to have a point that you believe in, but you're able to reduce your emotional attachment to that point, you can become better reasoning and thusly defend your point that you stand by more effectively, assuming that point has some basis to stand on. And part of this gets into why it's metacognitive skepticism is part of the critical posture. And up next, we need to talk about confirmation bias. Okay. Confirmation bias. By definition, it is a tendency to seek out, notice, accept, remember, or interpret information as support for previously held beliefs, even when the information is flawed, and to ignore, distort, or forget information that contradicts previously held beliefs. Now that sounds very similar to motivated reasoning, but I'll tell you why it's not. Motivated reasoning, explicitly speaking, is about reasoning processes. It involves more conscious acts of reasoning on the part of the thinker. Whereas confirmation bias is not about reasoning. It's about the general behavior to seek out, notice, accept, reject, remember, or forget things. It's about the salience of ideas rather than rational justification. So what makes confirmation bias so powerful? It gives people the confident illusion that they are following the evidence. So in a sense, let's say, hypothetically, for the sake of argument, we have let let's use a let's use something that's genuinely false. All leaves 
I cannot write today, apparently. All leaves are green. Just for the sake of argument. If we show person A source of you know pictures of trees with green leaves, we show person A actual green leaves. To hell with actually writing leaves out, so just know that that means leaf. Or we show that person an article that features green leaves, then they're likely to believe that leaves are green. However, the way it works, if I show him an article about autumn, then person A will reject it. Because it does not follow his mentality of it. That's his thought process. And by rejecting it and having all these other sources, be them true or false, he feels that he is following the science. That he's following the evidence. He feels better about himself. Doesn't mean he's thinking the correct thing. All these articles could have been provided by a legitimate source or an illegitimate source. Doesn't matter. As long as he believes this thing, he will reject the autumn. And thus, he can be made to reject the claim, to accept the claim that all leaves are green, even though it's false. Confirmation bias work with other biases to lead astray the people in unique ways. Example would be desirability bias. Desirability. Okay? Bias. The tendency to be less skeptical towards evidence that seems to support what we want to be true, even if we don't yet believe that is to be true. So, in a sense, let's say that even if we don't believe it, so person B knows nothing, but he wants to believe that, I don't know, I guess birth rate. is at 100%. So in other words, there's no miscarriages, there's no loss of life, nothing. Everyone gets born 100%. And this person doesn't believe it, but he wants to believe it because having a 100% birth rate seems like a good thing, okay? People not having to worry about miscarriages, people not thinking about the death of young people is probably a good thing. Therefore, he starts to believe something. He gets an article, I don't know, you just get a random article that says uh, breakthrough science, okay? Breakthrough science claims that this new drug will make birth rates 100% or that the drug is already being used and it made birth rates 100% and everything's good. But let's say that the way the evidence was gathered to make the article is flawed. Okay? Person B is not going to look at this. Person B is going to look at this because he wants this to be true, so he won't really hate it. However, if we give him another article that says birth rate at 10%, so either someone's infertile through, I don't know, um, some outbreak or something. Something happened and made people really infertile. Only 10% of pregnancies even, even make it to term. Well, this person is going to, even if this is true or false, we don't really know, this person is going to reject it and scrutinize how the science was obtained to even get here. Won't even bother trying to accept it. He'll just look for ways to reject, 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 reject. Because he wants this outcome to be true, whether or not he believes it or not. And he can be made to believe it if you show him enough of these articles. Kind of in a way that if you show someone a picture of them when they were a kid doing activities, they'll start to have memories of it even if it never happened. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. So how do we combat this? Well, metacognitive skepticism 
about the evidence seeking process, we need to seek out good data. We need to favor studies over anecdotal evidence. I would like to point out that that's an oxymoron. Okay, the the lecture slide says anecdotal evidence. Okay, evidence. The issue with that is that anecdotes do not equal evidence. That's something that I've been told numerous times by different people. And you need to follow the proper evidence gathering procedures. Now, here's another one that companies use, and I am a business student, so I know this one very well. And that's this. If I showed you this versus showing you this, Which one looks more attractive? Well, it's this one. Because in your mind, you're saying, oh, I'm only paying $19 because you have a bias towards the leftmost digit because it's usually what tells you the truth. Someone saying three mil and 3.7 mil, people are going to associate these numbers as being closer than this and 4.1 mil, despite the fact that in actual, you know, math, these are 7.7 apart and these are 0.4 apart. It isn't until you actually start doing the calculations that you realize that these two are actually closer and not these two. So in a sense, people will read this as $20, whereas people will read this as $19. However, to all of you in this class, I'm pretty sure you all know this trick and assuming you pay attention to it, it won't affect you as much, but it does affect the unsuspecting individual. It's pretty effective, it's still used in today. Another one's the hand is bias. When we have two equivalent choices, so bowl of food, bowl of food, A, B. If you are right-handed, you're going to pick A. If you are left-handed, you're going to pick B. You're going to pick B. My gosh, I messed it up. If you're left-handed, you're going to pick A because that's the one on the left. And if you're right-handed, you're going to pick B because it's the one on the right. Reason being is that people have some weird mm, tendency to choose whatever is their handedness is. So if I say there are two bowls of equivalent food, equivalent everything, nutrients, type of food, portions, everything is the same. You only get to pick one or starve, well, you're going to pick the one, most likely, that aligns to your handedness. Not necessarily true for all situations. And the correct answer to this is that people would rather eat anything before starving to death, for the most part, unless they're depressed or something. But the truth is that, you're <laughs> most likely speaking, you're picking the one that you're handed with. I myself am right-handed, so it's likely that I would pick the right-handed. However, if I know this is being tested, I'll pick the left one just to spite someone, because it's fun, you know? It's kind of fun. And of course, you got to talk about other biases, such as the framing bias. Which is that we tend to see choices presented to us differently based on their framing. Example, surgery with a 90% survival rate, 90% to live, is more, <laughs> is more enjoyable than 10% die. These are actually the same chances, but we see the word live and it's framed as oh you're gonna live that many times that's better on the human mind than oh you have a 10 percent chance of dying because that means that if you have i don't know a thousand people then a hundred of them are gonna die that doesn't sound very nice but if you say out of a thousand people 900 of them are gonna live well, we're still talking about death here, but we framed it better. This, this sounds nicer than this. And then we also have the gambler's fallacy, which is one of my favorite fallacies. Fall... Let's see. And that is the belief that past events influence future events. If I flip a coin three times and I get head, for whatever reason, People will say, 
The next one's gonna be Tails. They don't know that. They just think, oh, it's due for it. The truth is that the past, the past flips don't affect the current flip. If, let's say I have for a hypothetical, a fixed coin, as in both sides are heads, then it'll never hit Tails. Or I'm a master at flipping coins and I can guarantee which side I flip on. Then it'll never be Tails, even if it seems like a random chance. They have no collection. And even if I was flipping randomly using a fair coin, it still could, hypothetically, after many iterations of the test, give me 100% heads. I don't know. Maybe I'm in that weird world or something. And that's the point. Gumbler's fallacy is people tend to think that past events influence the future when there's no causal causal connection between them. Obviously, past events will influence the future. For example, say, if person A decides to, um, say, rob store, what's going to happen? Well, he has a few outcomes, but they all tend to lead poorly. He goes arrested. He gets, I don't know, beaten by the owner. Or, Lord forbid, he perishes. Because if you decide to rob someone, well, they're going to defend themselves for the most part. That's an example of past events influencing a future event. Because if he didn't do this, then he would probably just move on with his life. Or do something else. The gambler's fallacy, however, assumes that if person A flips coin, there's only two options. Heads or tails. But for whatever reason, the gambler's fallacy makes people think that it goes tails, and then from here, there's a higher chance it's heads, and there's a lower chance that it's tails. But no. It's always heads or tails afterwards. And there is no scenario where suddenly heads is two and tails is one. Because there isn't. That's why the gambler's fallacy works like that. But it doesn't work for something like this. Now, as for other biases, we have the in-group bias, as in we tend to favor members of our own group. Projection bias, where we assume people think like us. Consensus bias, which we tend to assume that the opinions shared by the minority are by the majority are correct. And hindsight bias, where we assume that past events were inevitable. Uh, yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty, but that doesn't mean they were inevitable. Okay, let's say, hypothetically, I play a game of chess, and I say, with hindsight bias, ah, the game was always going to end with me losing. That's bias. But in reality, let's say that our opponent here. This is going to be a very crude drawing. I have my knight here, and my opponent has a queen here. And this queen, in some other round, decides to checkmate me. But for some reason, instead of moving my knight to, you know, defeat the queen, I move a pawn up. Hindsight bias would say I'm always destined to lose. But if you're using hindsight correctly, because hindsight is 20-20 in many occasions, I would realize had I moved the king to kill the queen, the knight to kill the queen, then nothing would have happened. That's not hindsight bias. That's saying, okay, something else would have changed. But at the same time, that's the, also the mentality of, had you not done this, I would have won. Yeah, obviously. Doesn't mean it, but it happened though, so it doesn't really matter. Cognitive heuristics are just shortcuts, as I said before. Availability heuristics are, we assume that if we can easily tell, call an example of something to mind, it's common or important. So in a sense, let's say that the media reports on pollution, okay? And they'll do it all the time for global warming. They talk about it all the time. But for whatever reason, they don't talk about, say, I don't know, uh, crime rate in Chicago, for the sake of argument. Well, because the media will keep bringing up, you know, pollution or some other other topic they keep bringing up, we assume that it's just something that is like, super common. Like, whether or not pollution is going up or down, let's just say that for sake of argument, it's super low, but they keep ca talking about it. And the heuristics would mean would lead to us saying, oh, that's super common. 
But in reality, if we look at the situation, crime rate in Chicago is actually pretty high, but since they don't talk about said outcome, people don't really think about it. So we don't think of that as common or important. Whether or not it is or isn't is still a different question altogether. But that's the use of the availability, availability heuristic. Representative heuristic. We tend to assume that if someone or something has features typical of a category, they likely belong to that category. Mm, I guess... I don't know. I'm trying to pick something that would be easy to do. So let's say, hypothetically, somebody has a shirt that says Metallica, okay? We'll assume if they have that shirt and they wear it quite often, we assume oh, they listen to Metallica. Doesn't make it true, okay? Maybe someone gave them the shirt. Maybe it's a borrowed shirt. Maybe they don't even know what the shirt is. Maybe they're so young they can't even read it. Maybe they weren't educated and they can't even read the shirt. There are many things that it could be. Cognitive Fusion will make us think that, hey, they probably just listen to Metallica, or hey, they are a fan. Doesn't make it true. So here's the thing about heuristics, right? Well, it's true that heuristics can often be wrong. The reason we have heuristics is because they lead us to make shortcuts that save us time and energy on thinking. Because it turns out thinking is quite a long process when you try to reason it. Mm, remember, these biases, they don't make you stupid, they make you a person. At the same time, it is also human to overcome limitations. It is very possible to counter heuristics, but you don't need to counter them, okay? Sometimes just use your own judgment. And the final heuristic from the slide that I'm looking at is the anchoring heuristic. We tend to accept and rely on the first piece of irrelevant information received before making a decision. Um, if you guys watched uh, Squid Game, then you'll know that the suit man, so, you know, the dude wearing a suit, told him, hey, uh, give money, I'll give you money, give you money, if you beat me at this game of, I think it was Daki they were playing, and our main guy said sure, and you know, he kept playing and playing, and then eventually he said hey, now that you won this information, now he has the information of, hey, I eventually win, I get my money. Here's this other invitation to the Squid Games if you play it. So he didn't, he didn't even stop to think about what the Squid Games were, he just thought it was a way to get money. Nope, he got tricked into, you know, a uh, death game, <laughs> if you guys watch that. Uh, that's a really, I think that's an example I can think about. If you guys think of a better example, please let me know, that's just the one that springs to the top of my mind right now. Because it is currently 11.30pm. And that is the end of class three. I will be back with class four and five. Class, uh, no, that's the end of class two. I'll be back. Oh, before that, we gotta do one of the questions. So you realize class two, we have one of the questions here. And the question is this one. Consider someone who is constantly getting all of their news from Instagram or Facebook. All of the news is selected and curated such that they only read articles that unconsciously validate their worldview and previously held beliefs. What type of bias is Facebook and Instagram aiding to initiate here? And if you remember what I was talking about, the answer would be the confirmation bias. So that's the first quiz question done. We have two more, but we'll get to those when we get to those. Anyways, I want to thank you all for watching. Please stick tuned for please stay tuned for parts for the next two parts tomorrow. Well, actually, three parts um, three, four, and five of Philosophy 07 will appear, which will be treated as, I think, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, or 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Goodbye.